Coming up, could research on sharks end up saving the lives of hospital patients? The difference between the sharklet surface and the non-sharklet surface was about a 13-fold decrease in bacteria that transferred onto those surfaces. And will understanding grizzly bear hibernation help people live longer and healthier? What we see in bears looks very similar to what happens in diabetic humans. The big difference, though, is the bears transition into and out of that state every year. Exploring the frontiers of science probing cutting-edge technologies, seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. Call it synchronicity. More than a decade ago, a Florida scientist embarked on research for the U.S. Navy that was intended to make the hulls of warships more efficient. Today, what he discovered is being used to make hospitals cleaner and safer. A recent outbreak of drug-resistant bacteria in several U.S. hospitals has experts looking for solutions. Uh, let's get that set up right after we do this. That's the leading edge, so we're, we are detecting the coating on the edge. Anthony Brennan thinks the answer may be found in the oceans, specifically in the complex microscopic pattern found on the skin of sharks. Brennan's work on shark skin began 14 years ago, when he was asked by the Navy to find a way to keep barnacles from attaching to ships. As I was doing some evaluations for the Office of Naval Research, I came across this idea of the sharks, the little um, nurse sharks, and I said, they don't, they don't get barnacles on them, but a ship sitting at a harbor at a dock will have that same current and they get barnacles. Just a straight shark letter? Brennan tried to replicate the shark skin pattern, creating a film-like material he called sharklet. Same composition, different samples. He found the texture provides a dynamic and unstable environment for many organisms, not just barnacles. A young man from chemical engineering wanted to do research with me because he'd heard about sharklet. And so I gave him a piece based on his prior experience working with E. coli, which is a human-based bacteria at this particular species, and he knew how to culture it, so I said, well, here, take this film down to the lab and grow E. coli on it. And he kept coming back and saying, I can't get it to work. There are many surfaces out there that can stop water from settling on them, but the organisms can still get on them. And the sharklet just has a unique topography with those small features going up to the large ones and back down again, and that periodic nature in it is very important in inhibiting the, the attachment of these organisms. Because as water is, as the shark is moving through the water, the, the animal is moving, and as it moves, the skin moves, and it's changing the way those individual features interact with the water. So you're, you're getting very smooth flow, and then turbulent flow, and then smooth flow, and that, that structure, I think, is contributing to the cleaning action that the sharks undergo that helps prevent bacteria from growing on the sharks. Brennan believes the textured sharklet surface could help prevent the growth and transmission of bacteria. Can you walk me through the results that we've gotten so far? That theory is being put to the test by a company called Sharklet Technologies. They created a man-made textured sharklet film. Like the skin of a shark, the film repels bacteria, some of which can be deadly. Shining a laser through the film reveals sharklet's microscopic pattern. We use textures inspired by the skin of sharks to control bacteria on surfaces. It's no chemicals, no antibiotics, no heavy metals. It really is just the shape of the surface that the bacteria don't like. About two million people a year get what are called hospital-acquired infections. That means they went into the hospital for knee surgery or hip surgery, and they ended up getting some kind of infection while they're there that they didn't bring in with them. Of those two million people, we spend about $30 billion a year treating those infections, and 100,000 people a year die from those infections. Some of the bacteria that are out there are resistant. They're the multi-drug resistant bacteria that are resistant to different antibiotics. We just don't want the bacteria to attach to our surface, and when they don't attach, they die. So whether they're resistant or not resistant, they don't like our surface. Many bacteria, in this case a common staph germ, have trouble attaching to and growing on the sharklet pattern. 
We compare a smooth surface right next to a sharklet surface. There's 10 to 100 more bacteria on a smooth surface compared to a sharklet surface. Speaker and his team hope to bring the sharklet film into hospitals. The textured material can be attached to high-touch areas like handrails and doorknobs. Our pharmacist is working on TPA in the background. Dr. Margaret Sandy directs an emergency room simulation center where she and her students conducted a study with the sharklet film covering surfaces like cart handles and drug vials. When it really is a matter of life or death, people are always, by their natural instinct, going to uh, jump in, roll up their sleeves, and act. We intentionally had the Staph aureus bacteria, which is a common bacteria, uh, all uh, on the leg of the patient, so that they started with a touch of the leg. The patient became critically ill uh, and needed to have the defibrillator applied. And they grabbed that cart, and they had to engage the defibrillator by pushing the button. We were able to uh, prompt them, essentially, as the case unfolded, to touch certain places in a given sequence. The hand can be sort of the source of all evil as we then deal with the devices that we use to treat patients like catheters, uh, et cetera. Things that become invasive then become a portal for infection for our patients. The surfaces covered with sharklet, which cost 50 cents to a dollar per square foot, retained fewer germs. Mark Speaker says the material makes a big difference. The difference between the sharklet surface and the non-sharklet surface was about a 13-fold decrease in bacteria that transferred onto those surfaces. That's excellent. Back at his lab in Florida, Anthony Brennan hopes his discovery will create a new generation of surface-based technologies to prevent biofouling, the buildup of organisms. We're learning a tremendous amount of information from the the introduction of the sharklet. Everybody is starting to look at a mammals and people have looked at porpoise skins as a way of creating a texture to try to inhibit biofouling. And they've gone back and looked at whales again. They're looking at all the uh, chemical species that these skins release and trying to develop a uh, viable technology for anti-fouling. So it's, it's been extremely informative to us. Like Navy research on sharks that ends up in hospital rooms, science is replete with unforeseen twists and turns that result in important benefits for mankind. We sat down with UCF biologist Dr. Ken Fedorka to explore this idea and how it might apply to his own research on the sex lives of insects. Like Anthony Brennan's research that went into developing the shark film, you're studying animals. Tell us something about your research. So my lab is currently interested in the evolution of insect immune systems. And what we're trying to see is if we increase temperature in accordance with the predictions of climate change and how temperature might actually facilitate the evolution of very different immune systems uh, in variable thermal environments. Now when you start your research, you can go in completely unforeseen directions a lot of times with what you're finding. Well, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the core, really, of, of what science is, that we start out thinking that we're going to go down one path, but happy accidents lead us down another. And that's the case of my research, where I was studying how temperature influences how insects make different decisions, and I fortuitously found that it influenced the immune system. I wasn't expecting that at all. And so now it's led me down a completely different avenue. And that's a common practice in science. Penicillin was a happy accident that was discovered in the, in the laboratory and led to an entire field of antibiotics. Is it safe to say that in science, I mean, we've got a big world here. Everything in this world affects everything else in this world in some way, maybe? Yeah, that's one of the fundamental aspects of ecology, right? Everything is interconnected. And so uh, you can, it's really difficult to predict where certain discoveries might lead you or where certain scientific avenues might lead you. But at some level, it's going to be connected to the human condition. Dr. Fedorga, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Want to satisfy your scientific curiosity and be on TV at the same time? Send us a video question for our Ask a Scientist feature. Here's an example. My name is Kelly. I'm from Orlando, Florida. Um, I know coral reefs are important to the health of the oceans, but I would like to know why. Go to our Facebook page to learn how to submit your video. Grizzly bears fatten up every autumn in preparation for their annual hibernation. But unlike people, they don't appear to suffer health consequences from their obese condition. Scientists in Washington state want to understand why, in hopes that studying bears might lead to therapies for human obesity and diabetes. 
Reporter Michael Werner has the story. Plump, pudgy, portly. Call them what you will, but for grizzlies, being fat is being happy. They're sort of OCD eaters. They will consume so much that they're putting on nearly 10 pounds a day. If you translate that to pizzas, it's about 16 large pepperoni pizzas a day. For humans, this kind of weight gain could cause some serious health problems, like heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. But grizzlies have trouble surviving without it. All their focus is on is eating, um, which, you know, it, it's just born out of necessity. <laughs> If they don't have enough fat, they won't survive hibernation. Mm -hmm. Brutal lesson to learn if you're a bear. Grizzly bears can easily double their body fat in the lead up to hibernation. Some of the brown behemoths here at Washington State University's Bear Center will reach more than 700 pounds. Wild bears develop the ability to hibernate as a way to survive the winter when food is scarce. The fat they store up over the summer and fall fuels them through their long slumber. And during that time, their bodies change in surprising and incredible ways. They don't eat or drink or urinate or defecate during the hibernating season. The bear's metabolism decreases drastically. Their heart rate drops from somewhere around 60 beats per minute to 10 beats per minute. But perhaps the most remarkable adaptation during hibernation is that the bears become diabetic, or something that looks a lot like it. Their bodies become resistant to insulin, a hormone that regulates blood sugar. What we see in bears is, looks very similar to what happens in diabetic humans. The big difference, though, as far as we can tell, uh, the bears transition into and out of that state every year. So they exhibit a reversible, if you want to call it, diabetic state, which is not something that's very easy to do for humans. Heiko Jansen studies seasonal changes in grizzlies. With help from the biotech giant Amgen, he's trying to solve the mystery of how the bears make this switch. The answer could one day lead to a treatment for human diabetes. But to study this phenomenon, you need access to hibernating bears. And the WSU Bear Center is the only place in the world where captive grizzlies hibernate. <laughs> oh, don't scratch up my hood. Like <laughs> Many of these bears were nuisance animals rescued from the wild. And studying a wild 700-pound grizzly is no picnic. The bears are, are you know, not something you can mess with. Um, even trained bears will rear their ugly heads at times unpredictably. So we have to work with them in a protected environment and very, very carefully. Come on, Luna. Come on, Luna. Come on, Luna. The Bear Center has worked to train bears because if we can work with trained bears, we can avoid the need to anesthetize them to do simple procedures like blood draws. We feed the bears honey when we're doing voluntary blood draws because they like it and it's a way to reward them for, um, for working with us and um, it's also a way to keep their mouth occupied. As soon as we start feeding them honey, we can ask them to sit, and then we can ask them to lay down, and then we can ask them to stick out their foot, and they'll stick their foot out through one of the slats in the crate, and we'll be able to do a voluntary blood draw that way. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl, Luna. But not every bear is so accommodating. Some have to be tranquilized. We'll load up a darting pistol with the drug that we'll use to anesthetize the animal. And then a few minutes later, the bear will basically fall asleep. Researchers draw blood and take tissue samples. We know so little about bear physiology that every time we generate a hypothesis, it's almost invariably rejected because we, we just know so little. Um, and despite our best efforts, the questions we ask are almost always answered in a very different way than we expected. 
The key to understanding how bears switch in and out of a diabetic state may lie in the bear's fat cells. Here in Jansen's lab, they're growing grizzly fat cells, hoping to get an up-close look at the mechanism that allows grizzlies to go from being diabetic to non-diabetic and back again. Since our hypothesis is that it's occurring at the fat cell, uh, we wanted to work with those cells directly. There are about a million grizzly bear fat cells in this plate I have in front of me. Somewhere within that cellular molecular machinery is a mechanism that can explain this switch. The hope of everyone is that we would be able to treat diabetes. We all realize that that's a very long shot, but um, insulin seems to do similar things in the bear that it does in people, and thereby understanding those mechanisms could help diabetics overcome their disease. And as long as food is involved, the bears at the center are happy to help. Researchers at the University of Washington are investigating whether crows, like humans, mourn when one of their own dies. Sophisticated brain scans could help unlock the mystery. Once again, Michael Werner gives us a look. Few birds have a spookier reputation than crows. But that wasn't enough to scare Kaylee Swift away. Come on. No, you missed it. The University of Washington graduate student is fascinated by them. Lately, Swift has been looking into a unique behavior. When a crow dies, large groups gather around the body. Some of the more interesting anecdotes we were receiving that piqued our interest in researching this scientifically was observations of crows sitting for prolonged periods very, very silently, sort of silent vigils around these bodies, sometimes even placing objects on top of the body as if they were burying it. And then they disperse and leave the body where it is in much similar way to how I've experienced, you know, the funerals for my family members. This human-like behavior has led observers to wonder whether crows might actually be holding funerals. Swift and the team are trying to figure out if this is an emotional display or if it's something else entirely. Maybe it's a way for them to gather birds around and say, look at this place where we found this dead body. This place is dangerous. We should avoid it. So to study this, what I do is, for the first three days, I just feed the birds. Then on the fourth day, we'll introduce our funeral element. In our experiments, we use stuffed taxidermied crows. So you want to look up at the birds sometimes, but also look away. Just try and act sort of as natural as you can, considering you're holding a dead crow in the middle of somewhere. So we send out a masked volunteer holding our dead crow the way you might hold an hors d'oeuvre platter. A crow will come across the body of a dead crow and it will vocalize and recruit other birds to the scene. The number of birds that it recruits can vary up to 50 or 60 birds. What I'm looking for is First of all, whether or not they respond, and I measure that by listening for those harsh caws, those scold calls, and I'm also looking for how many birds they recruit to the area, how much time they're spending there. Swift returns several more times to see whether the crows react differently. If they appear wary, it may be a sign that they're associating the place or the person with danger. Crows have a remarkable ability to remember human faces, especially friends and enemies. So the thinking is that they'll remember the mask and not the person under it. So the main thing I've learned through this field work is that crows are learning a lot more people than I think we previously expected them to be learning. 
they're learning folks that they see who are simply close to or who are handling dead crows. But do they feel anything when they see a dead crow? University of Washington professor John Marsloff has been studying crows for nearly three decades, and he's found that they're anything but bird brains. Crows, relative to birds, have brains that are really on par with some of the small monkeys and apes, and they're more like little flying monkeys than they are um, birds. A crow's brain is only as big as a human thumb, but like the human brain, it's very complex. Does that mean that crows could experience death similar to the way we do? To find out, Marsloff and his team have pioneered a new technique. They peek into the crow's brains using PET scans. What this does is basically assesses where in the brain the most energy is being utilized as an animal's doing some task. The researchers show the caged birds a dead crow and then quickly scan their brains. We scan the birds by putting them under anesthesia so that they're perfectly calm in the scanner and we get a good image. But what we're scanning really is the brain activity that took place about 20 minutes ago when they were looking at that dead crow. We get an idea of what the bird may be thinking, what the bird may be experiencing when it looks at a dead crow by seeing what part of the brain's active. If the emotional center of the brain is active, that could mean the birds are feeling strong emotions. We know in the human's brain, when we look and see a dead person, certainly if, if, if you're viewing a loved one, you're gonna have a strong emotional response and, and that's gonna be centered in the amygdala. This is the sideways view of the crow. You can see a beak and the throat and the neck. This is the eye and here's the brain. In human brain imaging, we can see landmarks, but in the crow brain, it's, it's just sort of a flat gray surface. It's like doing a jigsaw puzzle that's one color. After analyzing numerous scans, Marslow's team is seeing more activity in a different part of the brain, the area associated with long-term memory. So when the birds see a dead crow, their brains are working hard to learn and remember. It could be a similar reaction to when people see a fatal car crash. You know, if you see a stranger this dead, you probably, you might feel sorry, but you're also afraid. And you're also wondering what, you know, what happened here? Should I, should I be here? Am I gonna be the next one to be hit? And this fits with what Kaylee Swift is seeing in the field. At least one of the functions of the funeral is to learn about danger. But it doesn't mean there aren't other things also going on. You know, at the same time that you're learning about danger, you might be feeling bad or afraid about it. Like humans, crows have strong family bonds, and they may react differently to a dead family member than they do to a stuffed crow from Marsloff's lab. But Marsloff won't be killing off crow families anytime soon. Hi. After participating in the research, these crows go back to the wild. If future studies show that these birds feel emotions, researchers would be flying high. That's all for now on SciTech Central. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for more stories from the frontiers of science and technology.